Organic farming is steadily increasing. That's good. Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. Le climat wandel erfasst immer weitere Teile der Welt. Farmers help us bring nature back and preserve biodiversity. Ceux qui sont dans le rouge s'en sortent quand ils font plus vert. La qualité dans ce pays, elle doit être là pour tous. Welcome to episode number 42 of Food for Europe. And this episode summarizes the live debate that we broadcast from the famous Salon de l'Agriculture Internationale, the International Agricultural Show, in Paris in late February. You can see that in full on our YouTube page. Amid controversy, protests and even disruption by irate farmers, our question was simply, what is Europe doing for agriculture today? Our guests in Paris were Catherine Gélin-Laniel, Director of Strategy and Policy Analysis at the European Commission's DG Agri, and Christiane Lambert, President of France's Committee of Professional Agricultural Organisations, known as COPA. And our first question was to Christiane Lambert. From her perspective as a farmers' union leader, active in shaping European agriculture policy, what is Europe doing for farming? The perspective of our farmers is a European perspective. France is not enough for us, it's too small a market. Europe is the right size. And this is especially the case when we see friction between trade blocs. The United States on the one hand, South America on the other, Russia and China sometimes working together. Europe has a history, it is admired. Our founding principle is peace, which seemed impossible for so long and is now needed more than ever, of course. For the past two years, we've seen war on our doorstep. We see how Putin's expansionism could lead to destabilization in Europe. And I should add that the way we in Europe are bickering right now is making Putin rub his hands together. We need to go back to basics. Right, but where does Europe's agriculture policy deliver value to Europeans? That became clear during COVID. French people did not experience food shortages, and that was largely due to the fact that Europe and the common agricultural policy makes it possible to produce in quantity, in quality, and to be able to trade. Historically, there have also been market regulations which provided long-term stability. So we talk about too many rules and regulations, but they play their part in enabling us to exchange healthy, reliable, marketable products with confidence and therefore to be able to trade. And then it is also Europe that has made it possible to support the renewal of generations, to have structural policies, support for mountain regions and environmental policies, little by little, which have in turn made it possible to confront issues relating to the protection of the air, water and land. That's what Europe is all about. At a time when people like to say that Europe only has problems, at a time when some people, even if they say it less today, but they have said it a lot in the past, that we should leave Europe, I think it is good to remember all that it brings us in France, beyond 9 billion euros a year that our farmers receive. By the way, that's already quite something, and it's separate from our national budget. And if there's one other figure I'd like to suggest that we think about, it is that only 12% of Britons today would vote for Brexit again. So that means there is still a very strong sense of disappointment in that country. It also means that we have to communicate effectively and be courageous because populism is rampant. Catherine, let's look at this from your point of view as a representative of the European Commission, the director in charge of strategy and policy analysis at DG Agri. What would you say Europe is doing for agriculture? I would say that agriculture has been at the heart of European integration since the earliest days of European integration. Why? Because peace and prosperity also depend on access to quality food. We should remember that at the end of the Second World War, there was not enough to eat in Europe, which is not the case today, even though there are still vulnerable people. From the beginning of the 60s, Europe has had a common agricultural policy with the ambition of ensuring that Europe produces its own food, a wide range of healthy, quality, reasonably priced food. And for that, we have to support farmers and in particular to support their incomes. Well, that's exactly the point, isn't it? At the end of the day, what Europe does for agriculture is finance it. Our CAP in Europe is a strong policy. 
We still deploy a third of the European Union's budget to support farmers' incomes. But the CAP also means a large market and a large single market. Farmers are offered the opportunity to produce both for their national market and for the markets of other countries of the European Union. And it is worth remembering at a time when everyone is talking about food safety that food security is something we have at European level. There is no single member state that can produce all that Europeans need to eat. Beyond that, I would add, there are other policies in which Europe is also at the service of agriculture and European citizens. The protection of quality products and traditional products, designations of origin, geographical indications, and therefore also the protection of our cultural and culinary heritage. Europe is rich in this diversity, and that is a good thing. It is important. Also, Europe is an important important supporter of research and innovation in the farming and food sector, which helps us to prepare for the future of our agricultural sector. We've seen an upsurge in protests by farmers recently across Europe and one of their major headaches, and it's something we've talked about quite a bit in the Food for Europe series, is the administrative burden for farmers and in particular the evolving environmental regulations encapsulated in the European Union's Green Deal. So, Christiane, what's wrong? It's true that terms like simplification, administrative burdens, bureaucratic burdens are heard a lot. Today the burden is heavy and there are many, many rules. I remember when we negotiated conditionalities in 2004 and then in 2014 when it was reinforced, there were 21 texts, directives or regulations that a farmer had to comply with to receive support. 21 is huge. When other stakeholders say our sector is not green enough, I don't buy it. You just have to look at the reality, 21 separate elements, and with greening has come additional obligations. And then, in the new cap, there are eco-schemes. To explain this simply to those who don't know, eco-schemes mean withholding 25% of economic support from farmers and releasing it only if we show a green commitment and engage with a certain number of qualitative and environmental measures that must be verified. And the difficulty is that, as much as farmers admit that there are transitions to be made, that there is no planet B, that the climate is changing, that biodiversity has regressed, that we need to evolve and improve. The rules to address these challenges are still extremely complex. And then there is the prospect of the Green Deal and Farm to Fork rules, 27 separate elements. I'm not going to mention them all, but it is a huge regulatory tsunami. And that's what farmers think about. And, by the way, it was something of a slap in the face for farmers when Ursula von der Leyen said on 13th of September last year, I want to engage engage in a strategic dialogue for the future of agriculture to move on from this polarization. That's essentially saying that there was no dialogue before and that it hadn't happened until then. It's now clear that since Putin has turned food into a weapon, it is in Europe's interest to rearm and not to depend on others. However, the Green Deal and the application of the farm-to-fork measures means less production in Europe. Can Europe afford to do this when the UN Food and Agriculture Agency tells us that we'll need an increase of more than 70% of certain products by 2050? So there was a problem with the way this was elaborated. And the terrible thing is that when things are wrong from the start, it's very difficult to catch up afterwards. So when we demonstrated with our tractors, it made a bit of noise, but we're talking about demonstrations in 20 countries now. It's historic. There is clearly discontent. Farmers feel marginalised, misunderstood and caught up in an avalanche of rules. Catherine, recently the Commission has made proposals to, quote, alleviate the pressure on farmers. What does that mean, essentially? It's always complicated to implement a common agricultural policy because we must ask farmers to comply with a certain number of rules before making payments. So that can inevitably lead to some complexity. And we should acknowledge that for years, demands on farmers regarding respect for the environment, respect for animal welfare, for example, have all increased. That's because they are what society wants to see. But it's true that we understood the need to stop a little and look at what 
in the current new CAP, but also in the legislation that is applicable to farmers in the field of the environment, health and climate welfare, what can we simplify? Or more precisely, how can the paperwork be reduced so that farmers spend more time producing on their farms rather than in front of their computers or in their offices? And so what did you do? We have consulted farmers' organizations, we've consulted the member states and asked them to identify opportunities for simplification. And we have collected many proposals which have led us to present a number of suggestions for simplification, both immediately and in the short to medium term. So, concretely, what does this mean? We are looking at certain conditionality rules, for example, on rotations, dates, non-productive areas, grasslands. We are asking how can we lighten the burden and give more flexibility to the member states without reducing our environmental ambition? How can we make life easier for farmers while maintaining a high level of protection, especially for the environment? En particulier. Christian, you've had a chance to look at the proposals put forward by the Commission. Do they go far enough? There can't be a one-size-fits-all answer to everything because there has been an accumulation of rules. We really need to approach these rules with a European perspective, single market, single rules and so on. That should be the basis. So there are some interesting things. For example, one of the proposals from the Commission on the table today and which responds to demand from farmers, especially those in France, relates to the ratio of grasslands and the obligation to maintain permanent grasslands. At the moment, the number of livestock is decreasing. We regret that. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And yet, even when there are no more livestock, farmers are obliged to maintain grasslands. How do you explain that to a farmer? It's mission impossible. And at the same time, the European Commission and other institutions and many Many stakeholders are saying less meat, produce less meat, and at the same time, Europe is opening its borders, importing meat from third countries, so there are still some inconsistencies. We really need to move quickly on this issue because this is something that irritates farmers. For sure, what Europe is not doing is doing things rapidly, so the reactivity of decision-making at European level is something I have a lot of trouble with. Well, we also need to react quickly because we're coming to the end of the debate. You've had your last word, Christiane, so it's over to Catherine to make the Commission's defence. Catherine. Well, it's debatable as to whether we are not sufficiently reactive. And then I should also stress that we have to take on board the views of 27 member states. And that doesn't happen overnight. That's also the beauty of European integration, that you have to get everyone on board. But I take note, I should perhaps add that in addition to simplification, which has indeed been one of the recurring themes in farmers' demonstrations in various EU countries. Another issue is farmers' incomes. We are also going to work quickly, in the same way as we have done for simplification, by making proposals. We will also need to articulate the views of various stakeholders, and in particular, those working in the farming sector. We are also going to work on the issue of value distribution in the agri-food chain, which is not just a regulatory issue, it's a question of the balance of power between economic actors. But we also wonder whether Europe can help the member states and farmers to do better in this area, because we can see that there is still a very significant imbalance of power between farmers and the other actors in the food chain, and that this is often done to the detriment of farmers' incomes, which, I would remind you, remain below the average income in Europe. Well, that's a good way to wrap up this 42nd issue of Food for Europe, a special edition recorded at the Salon de l'Agriculture Internationale, the International Agricultural Show in Paris. Thank you to my two guests for their participation in our live show and in this podcast. We'll be back soon with another episode of Food for Europe, looking at the challenges and opportunities of farming in Europe today and showcasing some of the characters working in the sector. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to your company next time.
Pour parler d'agriculture et d'Europe à la jeunesse. Le climat ceux qui sont dans le rouge s'en sortent quand ils font plus vert. La qualité dans ce pays, elle doit être là pour tous. 